So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, my name is David Crouch, and I am the cha chairman of the European section of the International Society for Respiratory Protection. It's a great pleasure to introduce you to the final webinar of our educational program series this year uh, on welding the multi-hazard process. So in terms of the agenda for the webinar, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to who ISRP is, and then we're going to get into today's topic. So we've got four keynote presenters today, uh, which is great to see. Uh, we're going to have a basics of welding types and hazards from Tobias Rosado from the European Welding Federation. And then we're going to move into more respiratory related technologies for welding application. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague from 3M, Paul Spooner. And then we're moving into uh, more around welding fume control. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Adrian Paris from the Breathe Freely campaign, who's going to, breathe, who's going to give us an update on the welding fume control selector tool. And then following that, uh, uh, last but definitely not least, is Neil Pickering, uh, who is going to give us a practical considerations for implementing welding fume control. And then at the end, as usual, with our webinar series, we will have our Ask the Expert question and answer session. If there's any questions through eat any of the presentations, please at the bottom of your screen or top of the screen, depending on how you've got Zoom set up, please use the question and answer uh, session to ask your questions uh, and we'll gladly answer them as we move through the webinar. So on to the next part, which is an introduction to who ISRP is, which as I mentioned before, we are the International Society for Respiratory Protection. We are a non-profit organization whose charter is to provide uh, advice and informal service to all individuals involved in respiratory protection. We have six sections across the world. Europe is just one of them. Americas, Australasia, Japan, Korea, and Greater China. And we all have the same objectives as a society to enhance the health and safety of people using respiratory protection devices, but also to encourage the exchange of information, uh, development of new standards and best practices. And that's across government industry organized labor organizations, manufacturers, and, and any other professional organizations. So uh, it's great to have the European Welding Federation involved today with Tobias' keynote presentation, but it's also in sponsorship with the British Occupational Hygiene Society, who have kindly provided Adrian and, and Neil today from a speaking perspective. So the education program itself, what are we trying to achieve? We're trying to introduce attendees to the role of respiratory protection in response to a range of industrial or occupational hazards and to learn about best practices and how to appreciate the risks and understand what RPE response can be used in the protection of individuals from those hazards. So today's webinar is around welding applications. <coughs> Excuse me. So brings us to our first keynote speaker, uh, who Tobias Rosado, who is the Deputy Systems Manager for the European Welding Federation. And, and Tobias is going to be talking about the basics of welding, the types and the hazards. So uh, Tobias has got a, an extensive uh, background in welding. I couldn't do it justice. So uh, in the interest of time, I'm just going to pass the floor over to Tobias, and we very much look forward to your, your presentation. So thank you, David, for that presentation. Let me share my screen and start my presentation. OK, so you should now be seeing my presentation. So I will be, uh, talk a little bit about the basics of welding and mainly the types and uh, the risks and not to minimize those risks uh, uh, regarding welding. But before, just a short uh, introduction in terms of a video left. So we are celebrating this year our 30th anniversary. So we have been here since 1992. Uh, so in terms of uh, the main uh, core objective. So we work on harmonized training and qualification and certification system in the welding technology. So uh, was created in 1992. 
by all the welding institutes of the European community with the aim of updating and harmonizing training and qualification in the field of welding technology. So in terms of uh, uh, harmonizing uh, qualification and certification systems, mainly qualifications, we are uh, one of the few in Europe that has uh, this kind of system. Uh, so in terms of guidelines of qualified personnel, so uh, we have them from the International European Welding Engineer to the International and European Welder. Uh, we have also some systems in terms of certification of companies and also certification of, of persons. So, but for the companies uh, that are doing metal working, construction uh, can benefit from this and have a certification according to IEN ISO 3834 standards, which is the main uh, quality standard in the welding uh, uh, area. So in terms of... Uh, uh, of the of background of EWF. So we are, uh, let's say, a federation of, in this case, uh, constituted of 46 countries around the world, not only in Europe. So we started in Europe, but uh, with a partnership with IIW, we extended uh, this scope to uh, other international countries in this. Uh, and we work on training personnel and welding and technology, qualification of personnel, certification of personnel, and companies well, or or on, on collaboration project many this is many in europe <laughs> so uh we have 23 training guidelines 52 courses and qualifications and certification so uh more than 300,000 uh, industrial personnel that was uh, qualified this is just let's say uh, uh, an overview in terms of the qualifications that uh, are available within our system. These are the ones that are combined in terms of the international and institute of welding in the, in the EWF. So we have the, the main uh, qualifications, engineer, technologist, specialist, and practitioner. So these are the welding coordinators. We have inspection personnel, welders, structure designer, and also a uh, part in mechanized orbital and robot welding. And in here we have specific for the European market uh, currently, but can also be applied uh, at more international level. So for the adhesive bonding, resistance welding, um, let me pick up in, in the laser so that you can also see thermal spraying. Uh, also, this is also specific for the European market because this is uh, uh, the, uh, according to the uh, harmonized standard in uh, metal construction, uh, which is EN 1090. And then we have other, uh, let's say, special courses uh, that are also available. Okay. So this is just an example in terms of uh, our guidelines and diplomas that we, we issue uh, through our members, uh, which are the authorized nominated bodies. They are the responsible to apply this system uh, in their scope, usually in the in their uh, countries. Okay. But uh, I come back to our one of the, our main uh, qualifications, which is the International European Welding Engineer. I highlighted these welding processes and uh, welding fabrication because I will briefly uh, discuss these two subjects in terms of the most uh, uh, used welding processes in terms of manual application. And then I will also talk a little bit about health and safety in terms of the hazards that are involved in, in welding. Uh, and the, this is uh, extensively covered in this course, uh, which is quite extensive. So uh, starting now in terms of basics uh, of welding, uh, welding process can be divided mainly in fusion welding, where the metal is actually melted and solid solid state welding where the metal is not melted but can, it, it reaches a viscous uh, uh, state uh, this is the case for example for friction stir welding uh, i'm not sure if you heard but this is just an example there are other processes where this is applied but we are mainly focusing today on fusion welding and in this case, in terms of the energy source, with, which is an electric arc. So, uh, as I said, fusion welding includes uh, partial fusion of the base material. So this is the, the parts that we are going to weld with or without filler metal added to the weld pool. In this example here, this is the 
gas, uh, but I will explain a little bit more in terms of the relax, but this, just for you to see that the can be a filler metal, which is added to the weld pool and then is uh, uh, joined together in the base metal. In this case, this is just a bit on plate, but it works the same as a welding part. Uh, it is used to make every uh, day item, so it is, is used uh, in automotive, in shipbuilding, in uh, bridge construction. So any metal uh, structure that uh, is built around the world uh, can, for sure uses uh, welding in a way or another. So, which is a big part of the market. So in terms of electric welding, so electric welding is a series of process that are used to join metal to metal by using electricity. So in the specific case of arc welding, so an electric current flows using, this can be in direct current or alternate current uh, in can have a filler metal consumable or uh, cannot be uh, uh, non consumable elect electrodes can also be used. As you can see here, so this is uh, an electric car, is a sort of plasma that is uh, created between the base metal and the, in this case, welding gun. It can be from MAG or other that I will explain a little bit further. And it's this is where the heat is generated to melt the material, okay? So uh, in terms of electric uh, welding, there are several other processes that are involved in this case, um, like uh, electron beam welding, laser beam welding. In this case, it, they are not using an electric arc, they are using light photons, uh, high density energy uh, photons that they are the source in terms of the heat to melt the material. But I will focus mainly on shielded metal arc welding, or it can also be known as MMA. Also, gas metal arc welding, which is uh, MIGMAG welding. Uh, and then gas tungsten arc welding, which is also known as TIG welding. Okay. Starting with shielded metal arc welding. so. As I said before, it is generated by an electric arc. Uh, it is used uh, on most uh, metals and al alloys uh, due to its simplicity where it's only need, as you can see here, a simple torch and an electrode stick uh, and a, a reliable machine to perform a weld. And in this case, the, the electrode is uh, 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 constituted by the covering, which is the that surrounds the metal rod. This is the the, the metal the additive metal that will be added to the melt pool. Uh, then, when this is melted, it will create a slag, uh, which is the covering that you see here. And this covering, as it vaporizes, it also helps protect. Uh, the uh, the weld pool uh, so that oxidation is uh, avoided and uh, the, the weld pool is protected and also avoids pores and other defects that, that might result from this. And this is just a rough uh, overview in terms of this process. Of course, when either the metal is transferred, in these cases uh, by droplets, and uh, the covering is also melted and vaporized. This will create uh, fumes and also the electric arc due to its intensity also has other risks associated like uh, infrared and UV light, but I will explain a little bit more uh, in detail afterwards. Regarding MIGMAG, it, which is can be a gas metal and the flux cord arc welding, so it can be a solid wire and uh, which uh, uh, consumable wire, or it can be a flux cord consumable wire as well. So uh, it can be take those two forms uh, in terms of it is an arc well cross that, that use an arc between between the continuous filler metal and electrode. So the wire is uh, uh, stored is uh, in the machine in in a spool, uh, uh, let's say a, 
a cylindrical spool which will continuous uh, feed the wire through to the through the the welding gun and to the base metal that we want to weld okay <clears throat> so in this case the metal transfer of this uh, wire can take several forms depending on the parameters involved so uh, in this case it can be short circuit if uh, we are talking about lower uh, currents uh, then if we start to increase the current that is involved and of course the the voltage uh, it goes through the globular phase which is uh, the torsion is drop by drop and then if we increase even further the current we go to a uh, to a spray which is a stream of uh, uh, smaller droplets of molten metal that will uh, then uh, create the weld that we want okay and depending uh, as a rule of thumb the higher the current the higher uh, the the fumes are created and, and the more intense the arc is okay so uh take also that into into consideration then the 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 third process that i wanted to briefly uh show to you it's the gas tungsten arc welding it is also known as teak welding which is uh, tungsten inert gas it uses uh one thing that i forgot in here it's this process also uses uh, shielding gas, uh, depending on the process, if we are talking about steel, it is usually a mixture of argon and CO2 or O2, depends on the application. Uh, if you are going to, let's say, the materials like aluminium or even titanium, in this case, it is mandatory to use inert gas. That's why we you see here metal inert gas or metal active gas, depending on the type of shielding gas that we want that, uh, as in the uh shielded metal arc welding will uh, help protect the molten metal that is created in here and protect it from the environment okay so in terms of the gas tungsten arc welding this process can be used without a filler metal or with a filler metal depending depending on uh the application the electrode is non-consumable so uh it's uh, uh, made of tungsten and uh, it will be the main uh, let's say source of uh, electrons to create the electric arc uh, and produce enough heat to melt the materials that we want okay uh, it can it, it is uh, from the three that uh, i presented to you it's the most clean of the processes because because it produces a more stable arc okay uh and as a consequences will produce the least amount of fumes from the the process but the other risks of course as the others because the electric cart is very intense and then uh, proper uh, protective equipment has to be used okay so i uh, presented a few uh uh characteristics in terms of the welding and the, the most used welding processes in welding but there are also health and safety concerns in welding instruction so in terms of the risk, risk factors the causes and how to prevent those uh, those risk factors so in terms of risk factors uh, there are several uh, one of the main are the fumes and gases that are, are involved uh, also in condensed material around welding because if there is spatter, uh, that spatter, if the environment around the welder is not secured enough, can lead to uh, problems in terms of possible fires and also if the welder is not protected to some burns. But I will also mention that afterwards, UV and infrared emissions. So this is from the electric arc and also electric current risks uh, that this can be from the machine and also from uh, the welding parameters uh, we are talking about hundreds of uh, 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 in terms of unit of amperes that uh, in terms of current uh, can be 80 amps but it can also in terms of mag can reach 300 amps easily uh, but the volts that we are talking about it's usually 20 30 volts uh, 
but it can also have some risk in terms of the heat. So, but we also have some noise that the welders are uh, exposed to and also some ergonomic risks, okay? So, fumes and gases. So, welding fumes are a mixture of solid particles and toxic gases that are generated during welding. So, more than 90% of the fumes uh, are from uh, vaporization of the constituents that are in the consumables. So, in case of MMA, they are coming from the, the covering and also from uh, the metal that is deposited in the base metal and the vaporization of those on metals, okay? So in terms of the, the smaller the size of the particles, the more dangerous they are. So after what I have a graph here, in terms of, uh, we can see here the welding fume and dust that is within the area of a respirable respir uh, respir uh, uh, components. If they are absorbed in the lungs, some of them are not coming out and then that is a risk that uh, should be avoided and that of course there are measures to to do it in terms of classification in terms of the types of gas and, and fumes so these are toxic metallic vapors so we have here more or less concentration and we also have hydrocarbons uh, from leftovers of oil in the in the well that's why it's important to have a very clean weld. Then, in terms of asphy asphy uh, asphy sorry, asphyxiating uh, gases, so we have CO that is from the combustion, as well as CO2 that can also come from the combustion, but as well as a protective gas. NOx, again, from uh, the combustion that is taking place. Argon and helium, they are shielding gases, but uh, if, the, if they are in huge concentration, that this is also a danger. And uh, since they are non-respirable, uh, well-ventilated zones have to always be assured. Okay. Also, in terms of oxidizing, we have the ozone that can come from again some oxidation and also from the UV that is created in the erratic arc. So care should also take care in, in this regard. In terms of the level of risk, so it depends on the composition, the concentration, the, and the exposure time. In terms of the fa factors, like I said, poor cleaning. So oils in, in the base metal can lead to, to their uh, being vaporized, and then, then ca that can cause issues. The welding parameters, so in here, there are examples. Uh, these are, let's say, filters that for, it was from a study to uh, find out the amount of gases depending on the parameter. So as we go uh, in this direction, the higher the current, the higher the, the fumes that are produced. Uh, but of course, if we choose other kind of uh, processes uh, for it, this for is for the traditional MAG process. Uh, but for example, if we go to mo a more a next generation MAG uh, welding machine, which has a more stable arc, and uh, it produces, produces less better, the welding fumes that will be generated will be uh, considerably less. So this will also depend on the welding uh, process, uh, welding machine that is used, okay? And then, of course, can also depend on the shielding gases because it will also influence the electric arc from, uh, let's say, the welding process. So if you go to a, a CO2, it will have a more intense electric arc and which will, will lead to more spatter and more fumes uh, consequently, consequently, okay? In terms of metallic vapors, so if we talk about uh, base metals in terms of carbon steel, we have, as a, let's say, possible uh, hazards, uh, chromium, uh, magnesium, and also vanadium uh, as metallic vapors. If you go to carbon, manganese, steel, we add to these nickel and cobalt. And stainless steel, it is mainly chromium and nickel. And copper alloys, of course, it's copper, uh, maybe lead, nickel, chromium, and beryllium. Just in terms of the hazard, so what consequences uh, these uh, exposure to these metallic vapors can cause? So, in gases, irritation in the airway, so inhalation of fine particles that can, let's say, be uh, lodged in the lungs, so, and also in the throat. This can lead to dry throat itching, coughing, 
high concentrations leads to difficulty in breeding and long term exposure can also lead to some further health concerns that was uh, a few decades ago some concerns in terms of the so called manganese fever so in terms of the long lasting effects it uh, means that these particles can be lodged in the lungs and giving rise to other kinds of diseases so care should also be taken here in terms of the gas inhal inhalation so uh, if you are talking about ozone can lead to a dry throat cough and can lead to bron bronchitis and pneumo pneumonia in the case of nox and then you same symptoms but it can give rise to polynomial edema so we are talking about fluid in the lungs so uh exposure to to these kinds of elements is dangerous so measures has to be taken to protect in this case the welder which is the person that is in direct contact of course there are work exposure limits in place um, to control this concentration of gases they are in eight hour long or 15 minute exposures these are just in terms of the uh, table in terms of the some of the of the limits that companies sh uh, should uh be aware of and now we go to how to minimize those risks in terms of the fumes and the gases that the welder is exposed to so of course adequate cleaning um, of the piece that they are going to weld to avoid any vaporization of oils and other uh, contaminants ventilation local general natural or forced uh, and extraction so prefer pre preferably localized next to the welder so these are a few examples in terms of overhead extraction it can also uh, be uh, below uh, and also above and below in terms of extraction of the welding fumes and gases other examples uh, so this is a more localized uh, extraction it can also be portable uh, to for example in a work site uh, where it is necessary to have further protection to the welder and then in also in the in the in the, in the uh, shop floors specific equipments and also it's also important in contained spaces like pressure vessels or other closed spaces it's very important to have uh, an, ext an extraction but also a good vent ventilation so that the buildup of gases and fumes is not a concern for the welder okay other kinds of um, individual protection so these are masks with ventilation with positive uh, pressure uh, masks with filters uh, to support even the the, the 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 fumes and the particles to reach the lungs uh, we already saw the portable ventilators and also torches with smoke is exhaust system so the there are a few student studies that came came out in terms of the efficiency but in terms of the cost they are still a concern yeah, this is uh, an example in here uh, but other methods are if used properly also quite effective so other uh, issues uh, and others other than the fumes and the gases so we have the incandescent material so this can come from sputter from the filler, filler metal uh, the sagging or deposit of the deposit material so this can happen if there are parameters that are higher than it is expected for well the, a piece and this can cause the molten metal to drop from the weld piece that we are welding and uh, if there is something below it can, it can be a huge uh, huge danger for for the welder and of course the spatter that is here in this case it's uh, uh, a MiG-MAG welding process that depends on, on the parameters it can cause a lot of spatter and also smoke that we already covered and also hot spots that are, that are resulting from welding so how to minimize so again stable electric electric arc so if it, we have a stable electric arc spatters will be minimized so we have uh, an example that I showed in terms of the welding process so which is the TIG process which has a very stable arc and spatter is almost non-existing in this process okay of course there is still welding fumes and gases but in terms of spatter these are minimized to the minimum uh this is what i'm seeing here so ad ad adequate protective clothing so uh, make sure that uh, all 
the surface uh, of the skin of the water is uh, covered by adequate uh, clothing, clean area around uh, the joint to be weld to avoid uh, and avoid combustible material. And also, uh, of course, sorry. Uh, surveillance after the weld. So because we are welding and after the weld, the material is very hot and uh, some proper surveillance should also be assured to avoid uh, and to minimize the risk of fires. Now uh, I'm starting to reach the end of my presentation and I'm talking about UV and infrared emission. So the source of this emission is the electric arc. So consequences, skin burns, ocular conjunctivitis, ozone production, skin aging, skin cancer. So if, again, if the welder is not well protected, these are the possible consequences that uh, he, he has. Uh, as a personal, I also worked as a researcher in, in welding and there was a, a part of uh, my neck was not, not covered. And after a few welds, I noticed a little bit of a burn in here, it, no uh, real consequences, but we, uh, we have to be careful when welding to be proper uh, covered every part of the of the body. So already covered some of this and to minimize the risk. So skin protection with proper clothing, eye protection with adequate uh, glasses, uh, actin, actinic glasses, uh, which uh, can these kinds of uh, protective equipment are based on uh, existing standards to make sure that the, the manufacturers uh, deliver those products according to those standards. Uh, painting the walls, so to avoid the reflect reflection of the UV light. Uh, okay. And again here, masks, proper masks and screening to protect the ones around the work area. And then regarding the noise, which the welders are also exposed a lot to the noise, either in preparation uh, of the assembly, cleaning the welding joint, cutting operation, oxyfull, plasma, care. This may cause psycho psychological irritation, poor concentration, pain, and physical discomfort. So partial to total deafness, so this can occur above 80 to 90 decibels. So again here, proper protection is also necessary. And finalizing with ergonomic risks, which is also a concern, because if we have repetitive uh, actions and repet repetitive positions, then can, this can lead to uh, ergonomic uh, consequences to muscle, skeletal. Uh, so all these uh, have to be taken care of. And I will finish my presentation with a comparative image regarding a bad practice and a good practice. Because if uh, all the the state of the art in terms of uh, welder protection and welding protection is done everything is safe everything uh, all the welders are protected and the persons around are protected so thank you i hope it was helpful for you and thank you very much i, I give the word again to david I, I hope that i was in time no that was perfect that was excellent many 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 thanks for that insightful presentation there, there's just one question in in the chat so far apologies yeah. for those who are wanting to talk in the chat but it's not working for some reason so if you could put your questions really in the in the q a that would be great but uh just to buy it's one from yeah. luke uh have you seen many torch welding fume extraction systems that work uh and he's he's, he's just put in his experience most of them yeah, provide yeah. very poor levels of control so any advice yeah that i was involved in a, a few years ago uh, in a project where they developed a, a torch with uh, uh, the, it was the picture that was in the presentation uh, and as you can see there you can see a glimpse of the fume welding fumes being extracted to the welding gun so it can work it is uh, let's say uh, another uh, layer in terms of protection to the welder but of course i think this will not uh, Again, uh, larger extraction device uh, uh, ventilators are always recommended, but um, they are not quite used yet, maybe because of the cost, maybe because of not interest from the market, because there are 
other very good uh, protection devices that uh, are also available. But at the end of the day, it's a cost benefit um, uh, matter that uh, is according uh, that the companies use use in this regard. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, perhaps no Luke, we can put you we can put you in contact with the EWF afterwards. Uh, yeah. Just uh, the the questions are coming in. Uh, so there's two related one. Uh, so we've had one on what are your thoughts on the car car carnis uh, the the cancer forming yeah, uh, yeah. Ability of welding firms and then there's a second one from Dennis uh, with recent 2017 reclassification of welding fumes as carcinogenic yeah. by IARC, what approach in terms of LARP and RPE should be taken by construction welders in open environments? So two, two similar questions. Well, I, I'm not, uh, let's say, um, health expert, uh, but I, I, I am aware that of some, um, especially uh, metallic vapors can be uh, carcinogenic, but again, if the welder is well protected in terms of uh, nowadays there are uh, positive pressure masks and also very good uh, welding instruction uh, and also oh, we saw from uh, the the pandemic that we have that those masks are also effective so FPP masks so the one the, the white ones so if the welder is well protected and the companies uh, that are employing them are also using the necessary protective equipment, this can be minimized. So, and again, there are the exposure limits that also have to be studied by the company, of course, make sure that the welder is well protected. But if all these measures are achieved, I think the, the welder is well protected and those risks can be minimized. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to follow on from that, so Mike Clayton has, has, has kindly put in the chat that, uh, in the UK, the health and safety executive have issued guidance on covering on welding uh, outdoors. So uh, in, in terms of when we upload the slides uh, into, so that's another question, the slides will be available afterwards on the ISRP portal. Uh, and we'll also look to upload any guidance documents for, that are relevant to this webinar. So thank you for that. Uh, just a couple uh, for just two more questions, Tobias, and, and yeah. in the interest of time, what determines the use of mobile ventilation system? What type of evalu evaluation is required? Well, that that, that is uh, totally uh, um, a, a matter of uh, availability. If you uh, they are in the office, in the not office, the shop floor, um, and uh, there are already. The main uh, ventilators and those are linked to local extraction. In this case, it's not necessary. But if you want to weld in a place where those uh, big extractors are not available, that can is a good opportunity to use those mobile ventilation. If, even uh, in the construction site uh, where there is and where it is necessary proper ventilation, or for example, in a site installing and welding. A pressure vessel or other kind of uh, uh, metal structure where they are possibly in a confined space and there is no possible in, of having, let's say, a, a big extraction. So those mobile are a good solution for that. In terms of the cost, so I already see Jason. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a vendor of uh, uh, <laughs> ventilation machines. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm, I'm not aware of the costs uh, regarding those ventilation uh, systems. Okay. Sorry, Sorry for about that, that Jason. I, I very much believe, I, I guess that depends on the type of welding you're doing. Exactly. And the yeah. Size of the vent uh, local extrusion that you need. In the, type of, in the type of filtration of those systems, because they will also have to have filtration systems because they, uh, I, they are not allowed to dump those directly into the environment. So, also, so to, have to take into, into consideration. With that, I would uh, very much like to thank you, uh, Tobias, from, from the section. That was a, an excellent introduction to welding. Uh, so I hope it was much. useful, yeah. Thank you. Oh, it was fantastic. So um, it's very difficult on Zoom, but there would be a virtual round of applause if we were in the room kind of thing. So <laughs> thank, you. thank you very much for that. Uh, so moving on, uh, so Tobias has given us an excellent introduction to 
welding hazards. So now we're going to look at respiratory protection equipment technologies for welding applications. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague uh, from 3M, uh, Paul Spooner, who is the uh, UK and Ireland product specialist for welding uh, within 3M. Uh, Paul has, has, has got a, an extensive background in product development across various li multiple lines. He's, uh, he's also a former colleague of mine from Scott Safety Days, uh, where he's very much a thermal imaging camera expert as well as a welding expert. Uh, and once he joined 3M as part of the Scott Safety acquisition, he is now the application engineer for UK and Ireland for welding. And uh, amongst football and F1, he also likes to walk his dog. So with that, Paul, it's a great pleasure to share the floor and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Dave. So uh, let me just share my screen. So anyone can see that? Yep, that's come across, Paul. Excellent. Okay. So um, So as David said, I'm I'm uh, Paul Spooner, um, uh, initially from Scott Safety, and then uh, uh, acquired which was acquired by 3M uh, about five six years ago. So I'm the UK and Ireland World and Application Engineer, but I also do the uh, thermal image cameras for, for EMAA and the uh, uh, rest of the world. Um, so I took up this role in welding about 18 months ago. So I'm still on a learning curve pretty much, but, uh, but I'm enjoying what I'm doing and what I'm learning. So just a quick uh, piece of housekeeping here. Um, uh, this presentation is based on information from various different countries and rules may vary from country to country. Uh, it contains an overview and use of PPE and should not be relied upon to make a specific decision. Um, each each uh, area is, is different. Uh, it's not a comprehensive catalogue of offerings um, uh, of PPE in general, but there are uh, uh, lots of various uh, ways that we can help you with that. Uh, uh, and that's pretty much it. So it's a bit of a, a housekeeping first off, just to, to make uh, people understand that this is not a, a full training session and a must do. It's uh, just simply advisory on what we, we can help you and what things are out there uh, to help you. So we're going to cover three subject areas, uh, the hierarchy of controls, welding safety and um, some welding products, just to give you a basic overview of what, what you can have uh, uh, to help you and what's out in the market. So first off, what is a hierarchy of control? It's a method that can help us to reduce or eliminate the exposure to, to, to hazards. So when the risk to health or safety from hazards needs to be reduced or eliminated, there are many options commonly referred to as the hierarchy of control. You should assess the controls in priority or preference from top to bottom, as from that um, uh, upside down pyramid you can see there. So firstly, eliminating the hazard. It's generally preferred as it removes the hazard completely for all workers and the responsibility for change is not placed upon the exposed person. So that's the best way of trying to, to keep people safe is to, to eliminate something that uh, you don't want to hurt, harm people. Substitution. Similarly, an alternative would be to substitute the hazard in a process for an alternative process that has less associated health risks. But again, it's one of those things where you still need to do that thing. So what can you replace that uh, with or um, help you do that, that particular job? So we can look at engineering controls. So isolate a person from the hazard, such as guards or fume extraction, but the responsibility is placed on the, the, the management of those systems, the, the, the people that are running the business and the individuals to reduce to, to uh, the exposure and do those safety um, uh, parts. 
Then you've got administrative controls, such as changing the way the equipment is used or another way. It, so that could be used as a, a, another way of reducing the, uh, the exposure. So less time, open spaces, et cetera, those sort of things. So um, put those things in place. And then you've got personal, personal protective equipment or PPE controls, such as using a safety helmet, glasses, or some sort of respiratory equipment. These are lower in the hierarchy because they rely on the correct selection and use. This puts the onus on the individual, the individual uh, as a responsibility and implementing their control and therefore reducing their own exposure. So it's always down to the individual to make sure that it's uh, fits correctly, is the right correct uh, uh, equipment. PPE should always be the last to be the last control to be considered and used because it's reliant upon the person using it rather than a, a, a system. However, some employees incorrectly jump straight to PPE, ignoring all the other options above. There are some processes where all the other controls are impractical or are uneconomic or impossible to eliminate, but you have to reduce these hazards to a safe level. So I'm going to just quickly run through some of those, those, those hazards. So the welding methods that can vary, welding methods can vary the hazards that the welders are exposed to. As Tobias has gone through, there are many different welding applications uh, and processes, TIG, MMA, MIG-MAG welding. And so do the challenges associated with them. So there's many different uh, challenges associated with each type of those, those um, welding types. These could be environmental, uh, the materials used, or the location of uh, the welding operation. Welders can be exposed to many hazards. And Tobias has touched on some of these. Heat, noise, radiation, vibration, which is one of the most common causes of work-related injuries. Air pollution, space restrictions, and hazards from falling objects. So what are the hazards to eyes and the respiratory system? So let's look at the eye, eye hazards in, in welding first. Eye injuries have been reported to account for a quarter of all welding injuries, making them by far the most common injury for welders. There are two costs, personal and business costs. Personal costs is the potential for loss or damage of sight. And the business cost, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, about 20,000 eye injuries occur in the workplace every year. Injuries on the job often require one or more missed work days for recovery. The Occupation Health and Safety Administration in the US reports that workplace injuries cost an estimated $300 million a year in lost product productivity medical treatment and worker compensation. So what are the typical eye hazards for welding? Radiation, including ultraviolet light, bright visible light, and infrared radiation. Then we've got mechanical hazards, which include molten metal, chipping slag, or high speed particles. So let's look at optical radiation. Our interest is in the wavelengths from ultraviolet through to infrared. In between this, you can find visible light. So this is what you can actually see. Visible light is the radiation that the human eye can see. The shorter wavelength, ultraviolet UV, is a higher energy of light and a higher risk of damage to the eye. The longer wavelengths are infrared IR and are also recognized as heat. Both UV and IR are invisible to the human eye. Welding auto darkening filters will protect the welder from the UV IR radiation. 
and it and the strength of these these or the protection levels that these provide is determined by what we call shade levels of the uh, ADF shade numbers of the ADF. Higher the number, the more shade protection you're getting from these these um, UV and IR uh, light. So some symptoms when overexposed to uh, ra UV radiation. Uh, Archi, which is a toxic radiation to the outer layer of the cornea and conjunctiva. Um, the cells die, but are replaced within 24 to 48 hours. And the vision is normally, or goes back to normal after that. Archi gives a sensation of sand in the eye. It's, it makes them abnormally sensitive to light and has an, 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 an and an inability to look at light sources. So you can't look at bright lights when you've got archi. These symptoms may not be felt until several hours after exposure. With severe exposure, you can get a clouding of the lens or cataracts. UV radiation is an IR, IARC classified as a carcinogen to humans, group one by the World Health Organization. So it is a very serious um, uh, hazard that we have to uh, ensure that we look after our welders for. Visible light symptoms, short-term symptoms, symptoms from visible light are, for example, spot blindness, bloodshot eyes, headaches. You also get red or bloodshot eyes occur when the blood vessels on the surface of the eye expand. So that's uh, 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 quite serious. And these problems are always constant. They can take time to happen, um, you know, hours. Damage can be immediate or accumulative. And long-term exposure can usually lead to molecular and retina damage. And this is always permanent. So it's so... Uh, this is something that you can see all the time. So um, you should be aware of that. Infrared, infrared symptoms include overexposure to the, to the heat can also cause problems such as dry, tearing eyes and headaches. Exposure to infrared light can heat the lens of the eye and produce cataracts over a long term. It takes a long time to happen, usually years, but damage is accumulative and usually to the lens. As mentioned, the uh, world in auto darkening filters will help protect you uh, against the effects of these, these radiations. And it's important to get the correct shade or darkness level for, for use in each welding process and the current being used. These are the recommended shade numbers a part of the EN standard that all ADFs are tested to. So you've got the welding process down there, uh, mag, TIG, MIG, etc. And depending on the current that you're using, because of the type of uh, material that's being welded, the, ma the, the material that's being used to weld, and the thickness of the material depends on what sort of amperage you need to uh, do that weld. So as a general rule of thumb, uh, the, the higher the ampage, the, the darker you need your ADF to be set to. Um, now, this is not, this is not uh, um, set in stone, these figures. It's down to preference as well, but these are the recommended uh, uh, shades uh, in the uh, uh, EN standard. Now, mechanical hazards. Most mechanical hazards are caused by high speed particles such as molten metal or um, chipping slag. Uh, you also get uh, high speed particles when you're doing grinding or, or those sort of operations as well. Mechanical hazards are typically accidental. Um, and there's gonna be a couple of images coming up now where um, yeah, you've got some damage to the eye. Um, you, you'll see in a second. Mechanical hazards are typically from molten metal chipping slag or, or, or welds, or high speed particles resulting from cutting metal, surface preparation, weld refinement, and surface finishing grinding. These are traumatic in incidents, often very painful, as you can see from that image there, 
and require immediate and specialist medical attention. They can be the cause for lost work time and impacts productivity uh, and cost the industry uh, 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 a fair bit. Respiratory hazards from welding. Um, do we know what we are breathing as welders? Inadequate respiratory protection is the fourth most frequent workplace violation. 40 to 50 welders in the UK are hospitalised every year with pneumonia caused by welding fumes. Two of these welders will die each year. Welders run a greater risk, 40% greater risk than any other professional group of, of being affected by lung cancer because of their working environment. Common and immediate symptoms when exposed to overexposed to welding fumes are eye and skin irritation, nausea, headache, dizziness, and metal fume fever. Other respiratory damage, damages can be chronic and often affect respiratory organs, lungs, and the central nervous system. These symptoms can show after months or even years. Common factors that, that affect workers exposed to weld fumes is the welding, the type of welding process and the composition of the welding rod, filler metals and base metals used, type of coating present, location, is this in open areas or confined spaces, uh, and types of ventilation, um, general or local. So there's a number of things that um, can affect worker exposure to, to, to welding fumes. So what are the regulations for welding activities? As mentioned, the carcinogen of welding fumes was assessed by the WHO, Cancer Institute, the IARC in 1989, and classified as possibly carcinogenic to humans, group 2B. This was based on limited evidence in human beings and inadequate evidence in experimental animals. Substantial new evidence from observational and experimental studies have since raised this classification. The present evaluation, as advised in 2017, is that welding fumes and UV radiation from welding practices are class classified as carcinogenic to humans, group one. Considering those hazards of welding fumes, there are there are needs to there are certain things that can be done to prevent. Um, uh, damage to the uh, to the to the lungs of uh, welders. Uh, to protect everyone in the workshop, there needs to be good a good central ventilation system. So that's that uh, um, uh, large extraction there. And to catch the fumes before they spread in the workshop, a local extraction can be uh, uh, effective. But for the world who is typically placed right on top of the plumes of fume, a personal protective equipment is required. So what can be done? If you visit the Health and Safety Executive website, uh, this gives you information on how to protect workers from welding fumes. As mentioned in the hierarchy of controls, see if the risk can be avoided or reduced. Putting controls like PPE and also health surveillance. Ensure all employers are correctly trained and understand the hazards and their own risks. And that's not just about the hazard itself, but it's about the PPE that's going to be worn as well and making sure that it's fit for purpose. They know how to use it and understand what it's doing to help them. There are cost advice sheets available on the HSC website. These will be constantly updated and gives practical advice on how to apply good practice for the control of substance hazardous health. Examples are the WL3, which is welding fume control. And this gives information on local exhaust, exhaust ventilation systems, respiratory protective equipment and general ventilation controls. WL2, uh, so that's welding in confined spaces where there could be injuries from the rapid buildup of hazardous substances. 
And a, another example is WL16, which is uh, arc air gouging and cutting, where molten metal and fumes are the main hazards and probably one of the worst things that uh, 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 you can do. So products, what welding products and options are available? So TIG welders, TIG welders working in, their working environment is generally clean, well lit and pretty well ventilated. Generally using fixed workstations and use a local exhaust system. Or, or there is good general ventilation as the welding fumes are low and so is the splatter. They have a limited need for full respiratory protection. Uh, so a TIG welder's helmet, uh, they need a helmet that is, <coughs> excuse me, adjustable. So additional PPE such as eyewear and disposable or reusable respirators can be worn. Slim and without protruding parts. So access into small spaces is possible. And must have good all round vision because they're trying to work in uh, 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 quite tight spaces and trying to see round um, things like bike frames or car frames or those sort of structures uh, where they need to get into uh, quite um, uh, small areas, tight areas. MMA welding, high, R, high infrared radiation, high concentrations of welding fumes and splatter. <coughs> Excuse me. Possibly working at heights. Uh, they will require respiratory protection and use a welding helmet with powered air. Additionally, additional protection of safety helmet if working at height. Uh, again, a good vision required from the welding helmet and an ADF with high shade protection. MIG mag welding. Again, they have high IR radiation, high concentration of welding fumes and splatter. Uh, they could have additional grinding activities, so working in and working in uh, confined or small spaces. They will require respiratory protection and use a welding helmet with powered air. Uh, good vision required from the welding helmet and ADF with high shade protection, and will have a uh, a, a lift up uh, potentially have a lift up lid as well for uh, to move the ADF away from the, the face so they can do grinding operations. Respiratory welding helmets have air distribution and airflow, which allows the user to be as comfortable and protected as possible. Approved protection levels of these systems should be to uh, EN 12941 to classification of TH3 to provide the best protection. Alternatively, supplied air versions are available. So instead of having a powered air like that system is there, uh, you have a supply from compressed air. Flexible helmet with flip-up function to easily convert into a grinding mode uh, and can also uh, include a safety hat to improve uh, uh, additional protection. But the key thing here is to make sure there is a good airflow around the face, chin areas, and either onto or away from uh, uh, the, the welding ADF to give you the best uh, 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 vision possible. So, is there any other questions? Hi, Paul. Not there's not many. I think people are still digesting at the moment. Uh, so, just give it a couple of minutes. One from my side, in 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 terms of uh, is the welding options with with uh, breathing apparatus, or is is that considered too extreme in terms of uh, protection or is it too encumbersome it can be too encumbersome but there are uh, uh versions or um uh that sort of protection available um but it but it is it is short it is short work in practice because uh, uh, a, a ba set would only have a minimum lot, um, amount yeah. of air um but uh but uh, you've got the compressed air systems where where you could have the compressed air um, plumbed into the area that you're working. Okay, brilliant. Oh, thank you. Uh, 
there's no further questions come through at the moment. I think people are still digesting, so we'll leave that there and move on. But it, uh, we'll, Paul will still be around for. Oh, sorry, there's one just popped through. Uh, just so you're not off the hook just yet, Paul. Uh, <laughs> when welding outdoor, is there a large dependency on PPE? I think the word a large dependency uh, is is um, uh, probably too harsh a way of saying it, but yeah, you should still use PPE when welding outside, whether it be uh, uh, with a powered air system or with some sort of reusable or um, disposable um, uh, face mask. Um, I think that, I think the real uh, uh, answer to that is you know you should be, you should be using some form of uh, respiratory protection when using um, uh, uh, any sort of welding um, uh, or doing any sort of welding activity. Okay, brilliant. And then so so there's quite a few <laughs> questions popped in. Uh, in the last few seconds, Paul. So can you explain about the RP management requirements for the P PAPR? That's from Catty. RP as in? Um... Yeah, so uh, so around the... Uh... I've lost you, Dave. Uh, I'm just see if I can. You're back now. I'm here now. Sorry, I'm losing out. Patty, I'm just going to open the chat if that's okay. If you can ask your question, if I can just find you. There we are. Sorry. Hi there. Yes, yes. yes. you can hear me hopefully. Get this. Um... Feedback sorted out. Yeah, I wanted if you could give me a, a little bit of an explanation about um, what you would expect the RP management program to to reflect as far as the PAPR. So what what the operator checks would be, what the um, what kind of documentation you would expect to have the company have. Right. The um. um... We would recommend uh, doing a a a um, like a checklist um, that you've got all the parts of the uh, uh, the, the system, and you would um, uh, say check the filters, pre-filters, that the uh, the flow of air is is correct uh, every time you use before you use the. Um, uh, the device check that your face seal on your welding helmet is in good condition check that your adf is working correctly uh, all those general bits and pieces and then by having a checklist you could say right on this day i checked all of these and they are all correct um uh, and it's something that uh, uh as, as a company we could help you uh, design or come up with Thank you, Paul. There's a few more questions popped in. What controls would you recommend for welding in confined spaces? Um, <laughs> it's one of those things where you've got to to look at the uh, the confined space and do your your um, welding limits and see see what the practice is. It all depends on on what you're welding and what your um, uh, uh, process is so it's a it's a case by case study that you'd have to look into to see what that practice is it's not a it's not an off the shelf um uh answer to that one i'm afraid okay thank you for that and this is an interesting question from johan is there any adapter to heat the air that enters the helmet <laughs> not on a not on a uh powered air system but if you um um a, a, a 3M, I'd have to say, say it's a 3M product, but I know of the 3M product that we have cooling and heating versions of the uh, supplied air systems. So, um, yes, you can have a, a, a warmed airflow into your welding helmet. Yeah, if you send us uh, your details, Johan, we can, we can put you in <laughs> contact with you for further information on that. And then just one from finally, the very last one from Tim. 
Am I right in thinking that HSE have advised not to use LEV outside and rely on RPE only? Are you aware of that, Paul? I can't answer that one, no, because I don't have enough uh, knowledge on LEVs. Okay, brilliant. Sorry about that, Tim, but thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry, Tim, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no, with that, Paul, uh, big thank you uh, no for problem. what I thought was an excellent presentation. Uh, we're just in the interest of time. We are going to move on. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Adrian Paris, who's going to talk a little bit about the Breathe Freely campaign and the welding fume con control selector tool. So Adrian is the deputy chair of the Breathe Freely campaign in manuf manufacturing. Uh, and he also, for his, in his day job, he works for Sellafield. Uh, he's got a, an extensive background in occupational hygienists, uh, at where he's worked for more than 25 years. So I won't steal any more of your time, Adrian. So it's a great pleasure to, to pass over the floor to yourself. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, and thank you, uh, ISRP, for inviting me on today to give this talk. Yeah, thank you for, for inviting me to today. It's been two sort of very educational talks that really have set the scene very well. For myself and, and my talk today, um, I'm still feeling a bit queasy after seeing that picture of the eye injury earlier. Uh, and how painful it is just getting a bit of dust in your eyes. So, um, so yeah, not not a a, a a very nice injury. So I'm going to provide you with an overview of the British Occupational Hygiene Society Breathe Freely uh, Welding Fume uh, Select Fume Control Selector Tool. So the plan for the next 25 minutes. For those who are not aware of the Brief Freely, I would just like to give you a overview of the campaign, uh, showing you the information available on the, the topic of welding fume. And then I'd like to focus then on the selector tool. So the selector tool, I would like to cover how it came about. Um, I'm going to try and give a live demonstration, but as you can see it might be a bit challenging me just getting my slides up. So hopefully it will work on out and I can uh, get on the web hub and give you a, a run through through of the web page and the tool. And then I'm going to get, end up by um, discussing really what's future developments for the tool, what we've got in, in, in mind for, for the uh, for, for coming couple of months. So yeah, this fortunately the headline is not a nice one to stomach. Um, so the, the occupational hygiene, we do like our statistics. But um, not very powerful is the ones around occupational lung disease. So it's something we're, we're not really proud of in the, in the UK. And uh, there's 13,000 people die from work related illness, with 12,000 of these caused by occupational respiratory disease. 9,000 estimated deaths caused by asbestos related diseases in the UK. And around 20,000 estimated new cases of self reported breathing or lung problems caused or made worse by work. So the stats speak for themselves, really. There is a hidden panic pandemic there that is just about starting to get the focus it requires. So what is Brief Really? So Brief Really is an initiative that, that hopes to empower employees so they can reduce some of those hor hor horrifying statistics. So it was launched in 2015 for the construction industry. So it was an idea of a previous BOHS past president who invested a lot of time as well as BOHS uh, head office and a network of volunteers uh, to get the campaign up and running. So this was followed in 2017 by the launch of Brief Freely in, in a manufacturing campaign. So how is the campaign different to any other? Well, it does, does still aim to protect workers from respiratory ill health reduce occupational lung disease in the UK and raise awareness and educate on prevention in the workplace. It does this by the normal mechanisms of telling businesses what the issues are and the consequences and delivers a message that a healthy, profitable business is one that workers uh, at work, are at work and healthy in a healthy state. But the main difference in this initiative, it doesn't just stop telling people what the issues are. So it tells businesses about the solutions, how to control exposure, and what measures they need to deploy to ensure they continue to work effectively. So the campaign was relaunched in 2021 uh, following COVID uh, and in 2022 then a forward strategy was 
uh, devised uh, with some new focal points and key improvements. So the campaign is split into two. So it's split into construction and manufacturing. So there's a lot of crossovers between these two areas, but the reason why we, we split them into two separate campaigns is they work very differently. So we needed to target, target them separately. So the brief reading construction offers guidance on significant range of health hazards for, uh, that can be present on a construction site. And there's a list there that you can see that are just some of those. And the brief reading manufacturing um, currently focuses on, on the key area of welding fume. So we've already seen from talks from uh, Tobias and, and Paul today what are the hazards presence in, in uh, for, for welders. So the Brief Really Information Hub, this is the, the key to, to Brief Really. So this is available at briefreally.org.uk uh, and it, all resources are free and can be downloaded. So the resources that are available are such things as case studies, checklists, toolbox talks, et cetera. So there's an immense amount of information available through this portal. So it's pulled together by volunteers uh, and they remain the heart of all the information that's that's uh, uh, available. It's gathered all their wealth of exper exper expertise and experiences, downloaded it from them and constructed it into easy to use guidance and tools. And again, made them freely available to the world. So what did we try to target for this information? Well, originally we started off by targeting managers and supervisors. So we've seen these as the, the key group, the key decision makers. So those that hold the budget and the power to make changes in the workplace. But as we, as we progress through the campaign, it's actually been a useful resource for, for, for many disciplines. So health and safety professionals, occupational hygienists, designers, installers, controls, installers of controls and LEV systems, I've all used this as a, a vital source of information, even directly or to reference to their customers. So I invite you to go and have a look at, uh, at the information available in the construction hub. But I'm really here today to talk about uh, Wilding Fume and, and the manufacturing campaign. So we've seen some glimpses of uh, statistics already. Um, so why did we choose wild and fume uh, as, as the first topic? So wild and fume is, can cause asthma germ, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, and, and affect the nervous system. So we have uh, around about 290,000 welders in, in the UK. So this is, this is a large population of workers and that can be potentially exposed. And we have around 150 preventable tragedies in terms of work-related deaths per year. Um, as well as 40 to 50 cases of hospitalisation of pneumonia caused by inhaling metal fume. So around the time of launching the Brief Reading Manufacturing Campaign, then the, uh, it was a reclassification of the wound fume as a Category 1 carcinogen. Also, the UK uh, regulators have uh, had undertaken a substantial amount of intervent intervention campaigns and identified very poor pra practices in terms of control of wound fume. So it was therefore a standout topic to, to initially focus on for, for the manufacturing campaign to raise uh, awareness. So this shows some of the slides and some of the format, format uh, um, the information sheets and guide sheets that, that are available on the, um, the manufacturing hub. So the construction and manufacturing have a very really similar feel, feel and that was uh, deliberate. Uh, so the, you know really what you're going to get through the, the web portal and, the, and the, the hub. So, yeah, we, we providing this information required to, to manage risk is, is the main sort of underpinning sort of focus of the campaign. Uh, so we will have a look a bit more in the, at the hub in, the, in, in a second, and we'll also have a look at the, the selector tool uh, as well. So the selector tool is something different for the manufacturing campaign. So it helps duty holders select and specify the correct uh, extraction systems for their welding activity. So it, it was produced by a working group of, of experts. 
So they gathered together and brainstormed the key parameters that they could uh, that are required that could affect the, the content uh, and the level of uh, fume and a degree of exposure. Surprisingly, uh, when we got all the information uh, together and the opinions together, there was quite a good consensus uh, about what those parameters are and what could influence what type of controls we'd need to deploy. So we gathered all this to, together uh, and the output was building the, the selector tool. So a key objective, objective of the tool was uh, for it to be designed to be simple to use and also free and available to, to all. So there's a link there to the to the to the selector tool, which we, again we'll have a look at in a minute. So currently we are working on a new, updated, more user-friendly version, which will include additional information and, and, and techniques. So how is the this selector tool constructed? So the working group identified a number of criteria um, that would govern the content of, of, of the, and the quantity of the, the fume from the welding process. So ask questions around what type of welding is, is being undertaken, what type of metal is being, being welded, what the size of the workpiece, and how long will the welding take place? So the selector tool provides advice on the best available control solution. So this is the optimum control that you could deploy for the, the questions that have been uh, answered. It provides links to other suitable alternative fume control solution, as it's recognized that for one-off jobs, it may not always be possible to have the optimum control solution available. So every fume control solution, there are limitations to its use and its ability to adequately capture fume. And these are addressed um, in control, control sheets, which um, support the, the output from the selector tool. So hopefully we should be able to uh, see now the selector tool. Um, David, you can confirm if you can't see the, the, the selector tool. No, we can see it, Adrian. It. That's great. Thank you very much. So, right. Okay. So, firstly, I'll just give you sort of a, a feel for what's available on the um, Brew Freely Manufacturing um, Hub. So, there's a number of supporting guidance documents. So, there's guidance there available on the selection, procurement, training, uh, the management program, maintenance, and fit testing for RPE. There's also a, a welding fume toolbox talk. So this is something for in, in employers to use to discuss welding fume and their hazards with their in, employees. It also, um, at the back of the toolbox talks, has something called a, a visual um, management standard. So that tells you really what good looks like. So an, 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 an employer can take that out into the to, to the field and there's a series of questions that they can ask to, to say, you know, have they employed good practice within the workplace? There's guidance available for uh, exposure to manganese hazards and the controls that are available. And a general introduction to, to LEV uh, as well, as well as some guidance on the hierarchy of control. Uh, we've got uh, some information uh, Sheet, a control sheet here on the monitoring exposure to, to welding fume. Uh, and I'll open this one up so you can just get a, a feel for that. Yeah, so that talks about when you would need to undertake air monitoring, the type of monitoring that's uh, available in, in terms of personal or biological monitoring. So it talks about why do you need monitoring, the legal requirements of, of that, how you would start in the process of arranging to get uh, monitoring undertaken. It talks about the part uh, particulars of a, a, an air monitoring survey. So, you know, when um, somebody's coming in to do you a survey, that's actually they're doing the, the, the right thing uh, and deploying the right methodologies and the right equipment. Tells you how to interpret the results. 
And there's a bit of information there about biological monitoring that's also uh, um, available. So if we go back to the uh, the brief really hub, uh, which I might just have to open it again because um, unfortunately the control bar is right over my uh, window browser. So. Yeah, the other last thing I wanted to put, point out really uh, as well is, is just a, a part of briefly that I think is a real sort of powerful tool. It actually sits, sits in the construction hub. And it's this high management standard. So this was actually constructed for, for the construction industry, but is actually applicable to, to all industry select, set, sectors. So high standard is a self-assessment tool to enable you to go and, and understand better uh, to, to manage worker your health risks within in, in the workplace. So it's there for managers, uh, health and safety uh, workers. And it really defines best, best practice um, using six point framework of, of, of good practice. So it sets six leading indicators, which are around leadership, program management, uh, planning and prevention, uh, risk assessment and competency training and behaviours. And it gives you a really a form to, to work through. Uh, which allows you to, to go out into the workplace uh, and ask a series of, of questions. So on each uh, leading indicator for this one's example is leadership and commitment. So as a question, is work health protection given the, the same recognition as safety? And there's some evidence there you can go and look for. Um, and based on the evidence you find, you can score that, that question. Uh, there's a scoring table to tell you what score you can allocate to each question. Uh, and then you total it up for all the, the leading indi indicators to give you sort of an overall score. And it shows you where you are in terms of um, work health protection in, in, in the workplace. Um, as you work through, there'll be actions you identify that you need to take. And there's an action plan at the back of the form to enable you to um, document them and allocate them out to, to individuals. And the most powerful thing about this is, is really it's a benchmark. So you can come back and periodically review this and see how you, you're improving um, in the workplace in terms of managing um, those uh, health hazards. So let's move on to the um, selector tool. So as I, as I mentioned before, the selector tool works by um, a series of questions that you, you need to fill out um, as you move through uh, the different layers. So we'll start off if I choose just uh, an example, manual metal arc welding. If we say that we're going to be cutting, uh, say, miles steel. So if the welding process is, is like to go on for, for, say, 15 to 60 minutes. And we are cutting a medium size piece of um, material. So uh, it, it gives a, a basic description of what, what, what a size of material is that you cut, you cut in. So we'd, in this instance, we'd be doing uh, a, a material that's um, in the region of two to, to one meter. So the optimal control solution for this selection is extracted booth from the, the information we've populated. So what is an extracted booth? Well, actually for every um, solution, we've given uh, a control sheet. And this control sheet really provides some fundamental information about uh, this option. So it gives you a picture, so you can visualize what an extracted booth uh, looks like. It also gives you this effectiveness rating. So we know due to to a minimum human interaction, well, extracted booths are a fairly reliable technique. 
So the expert group gave uh, a rating for this type of control of four, four and a half stars. So, you know, if you deploy this technique, then you're going to get a good fume control. We're giving some rough um, information on purchasing costs uh, and ongoing costs for, for maintenance of these, these type of systems. Uh, the cost in here is, is, is really just an indication of the bench itself. It doesn't really cover any sort of peripheral installations that would be required. And it gives some general information about what is an extracted uh, booth and some of the sort of the critical criteria that we, we need to, to consider or sort of ensure it's in place. So for instance, in this one, it's, it says in the, the text there, we need to ensure that the, the control of feeling that the average face velocity of the, the booth is between 0 0.1 and uh, 0.5 and 1 meters per second. Ideally, we need to extract the, the fume out, outdoors. And the, the specification the bench used for, for grinding maybe actually be different to, to, to that solely used for, for welding because we know grinding particulates have got a, a higher velocity or released at high velocity. So, so we'll need more uh, air movement to overcome that velocity and capture and retain that um, substance. So it's got uh, some information on uh, limitations of the, the 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 extracted booth. So really, these are only suitable for for medium to small size items, the large items, then you, you, they won't typically uh, work because uh, you can't physically get them on, into the booth. Uh, and performance obviously drops off as you move further away uh, out of the booth as well. If it's it's key that it, the the um, the actual piece is actually inside the face uh, to capture the fume. And then it's got some other considerations. So if you invest in this bit of bit of kit, what else would you need to, to think about? Well, you need to think about the installation commissioning um, and maintenance of the, the system. And we've got supporting management sheets, which we'll have a look at in the, the minutes, which gives information on it, each of these topics. We, if we want to provide supplementary RPE, then there's a, uh, a control sheet um, available for, for RPE. Uh, if you wanted to undertake some air monitoring to confirm that the control has been uh, effective, there's a, a management sheet on um, air monitoring. And to, to, to support the, the control strategy and the management strategy, uh, we should be deploying health surveillance. So there's a management sheet, uh, sheet on how we could effectively deploy uh, health surveillance in, in the workplace. Some top, top tips about the, the, the use of the LEV to make sure we get the maximum performance from it. Um, and also some alternative control solutions. So if, if you can't deploy this, this optimum solution, then some alternatives if you're using MIG welding would be to look at uh, on torch uh, extraction. And for occasional short duration work, it may be acceptable to, to solely rely on RPE. Um, but I mean, that's really for non-routine work, maintenance tasks. However, you know, we need to do everything we can uh, to make sure that RPE is a last resort um, and explore other options if we, we can. So a very quick glimpse then of the management sheets, if we can have a look at the uh, respiratory health management sheets. So a general description on what is health surveillance, why is it needed for welders, uh, and how do we develop it, um, and what should it include, what should it look like? So if you go into a, a third party to provide that health, health surveillance, then you you really know what you're, you're asking for uh, and what service you can guarantee what the service are providing is, is what you should um, expect. So... If we go back to my slides. Okay. So the next phase of the, the selector tool. 
So I mentioned before, we're currently developing a, a new new platform. Uh, so the working group has identified a, a number of improvements that could be uh, a benefit to to develop into the into the uh, selector tool. So currently, we're reviewing those and starting to pull together the new material for the the uh, the, the selector tool. Um, some of those things that we're going to consider putting into that is uh, an option for the, uh, a welding technique of flux cord arc welding, and also including of some garden sheets, including welding outdoors, general LEV management uh, and uh, best practice uh, steps to consider when purchasing uh, LEVs um, as just some uh, examples. So broadly, then looking at the next phase for the manufacturing uh, metal working uh, manufacturing campaign. So this is uh, currently the, the regulator has been undertaking a round of interventions um, in the fabrication and engineering sector. Uh, and although there's been some improvements noted for the for welding sector, they compared to previous campaigns, there's still poor compliance for the metal working fluid sector. So in a, in a exposure to metal working fluids or process generated ha hazards um, from, from the metal working fluid process can cause respiratory health risks such as occupational asthma, occupational hypersensitive pneumonitis, bronchitis, irritation of the upper respiratory tract and breathing difficulties. So we're still seeing very poor practices in terms of low application of LEVs on CSC machine, CNC machines low application of health surveillance, still seeing a lot of compressed air use to blow down machines to do cleaning, which generates an aerosol, which is potential for, for exposure. And we're not seeing universal monitoring of water fluid uh, quality. So we thought this would be the next natural step for the brief reading manufacturing campaign as it fitted well currently with the, the engineering and the metal fabrication sector. So the metalworking campaign will focus on two areas. Firstly, it will uh, focus on duty holders, supervisors and managers, and we'll do the same that we've undertaken for the construction and uh, the welding campaign and pro provide all that information in a, a, a subhood, a microhub, uh, which will give uh, managers information on ensuring that controls are fit for purpose, that workers have got enough information to, to ensure they're adequately trained and the correct standards are, are being maintained in the, in the workplace. So in, in addition to that, this uh, campaign, uh, we also plan to provide information um, for occupational hygienists, because there's still some confusion uh, around um, undertaking exposure assessments uh, for metal working fluids. So there's a small group being set up currently um, to, to pull this material to, together. Uh, and one of those uh, aspects is going to be how would we provide advice uh, on assessing metal working fluids exposure without doing uh, air sampling. So this campaign is, is in collaboration between HSC Science Division, uh, the United Kingdom Lubricants Association and, and, and BOHS. So just really to, fi to, to finalise the today, it's just really to say, uh, to end on a, on, a, on a positive note. So no one really expected at the start of this project um, the interest that it would attract from other parts of the world. So this campaign, the, grow, grow, the Breathe Freely brand, is now a global brand. So it's been adopted by major English-speaking companies around the world. Australia and New Zealand have already launched their hubs and the US and Canada are soon to go live. So the content has been translated into the local and national legislation. And this is supporting a half a billion workers. So this is the larger, largest global occupational hygiene campaign in the world. So this truly is recognition that we are stronger as a collaboration, sharing of resources and knowledge uh, to make a, a, a real impact. So the last call out uh, is really to, to share the information, uh, become a brief really partner or supporter to use the, the, the material. 
Uh, and that's it from my talk today. So um, I'd like to now open for uh, any questions. Thank you much. Thank you very much, Adrian. I thought that was wonderful. Uh, in terms of just looking at the chat, there's nothing in at the moment. It's it's a very comprehensive program. It's great to see that it's reached uh, truly international global status. Uh, is there any plans from from the welding side? Is there any plans to look at other specific so asbestos space to mind in terms of other tools, shall we say? Uh, or is it or is it just predominantly the welding at the moment? Because I can imagine it, it takes up a huge amount of effort to to generate this on a voluntary basis. Uh, it, it does. Um, I think the construction um, hub would be a place to go to for, for advice on asbestos. Um, but there's a whole other wealth because the construction industry uh, is exposed to all sort of risks you can uh, imagine uh, from silica dust, uh, 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 asbestos, lead, etc. So, yeah, it's a place to go really for for, for some more general information. And uh, you'll, you'll probably find within that hub you'll get the information you require for majority of hazards in the workplace. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I can't see any other questions that relate to your presentation. There's uh, so with that, Adrian, I'd just like to say a big thank you on behalf of this section. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh, no, just to, that's uh, Alvaro's just saying uh, for greetings from Brazil, as I said, it's very informative. So thank you. Uh, so just moving on to our last presentation of the day, certainly not. Uh, just bear with me on slides. So. Uh, this follows on from, from Adrian's excellent presentation uh, around, so now some practical considerations for implementing improved welding fume control. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Neil Pickering, who is the hs &E Director and Consultant at NA and C Consultants and Chair of the Breathe Freely campaign. Uh, just bear with me. There we are. So uh, as you can see on the screen, uh, Neil has an extensive background in occupational hygiene uh, and he's worked in many, many companies over the years, uh, mainly at a global level within the hs &E domain. So without further ado, Neil, I'll pass the floor over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, David. Um, I guess follow that because there's, uh, there's some really good presentations there. So. Um, Hopefully I can contribute something that, uh, additional to what's been shared so far. Okay, is that good to go? Visible? Yeah, that's complete. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, this is about practical considerations and based over more years than I care to mention in terms of experience. Um, and in, to put it another way, trying to turn this sort of situation, which you may come across from time to time in a workplace, into something that looks a little bit more like this, where clearly the welding fume is controlled. So that's what uh, we've been trying to do on a number of occasions across uh, a number of companies. And um, just to give a little background to this, I suppose the um, health warning in a way in that this isn't based on a specific company. Um, it's an amalgamation of experiences. Um, I'm now set up on my own, so I don't feel I'm able to share it uh, any particular company, but it's uh, from a variety of metal components, so including mild steel, aluminium, titanium, and some exotic alloys. Um, from a couple of welders doing a specialist task to a couple of thousand welders um, who between them were using something like 10,000 miles of welding wire, which amounted to 4,000 tonnes or thereabouts, we, we decided it probably came to in terms of the welding wire in the course of a year. Um, also from one location to a global project, a global improvement project, and across, uh, sadly, uh, 30 plus years from a chartered occupational hygienist to a hs &E director. So hopefully it's useful. So starting point, we've heard from Tobias and also from Paul about the hazards from uh, welding, welding fume being the, the starting point of the one that we're going to 
focus on today from my perspective. Uh, we know it's condensed metal vapor forming respirable particles, which is a category one carcinogen for lung cancer. And we also know there are specific workplace exposure limits for different metals, depending on what it is that you're using within the welding and within the consumable. We also heard from uh, Tobias and from uh, Paul about the additional substances that has this to harm. So asphyxiant gases, uh, some gases are emitted by the process and ozone that is uh, sometimes generated, particularly by the ultraviolet. And we don't want to forget the ultraviolet itself, the heat and infrared radiation and the ergonomics. And again, that's been covered elsewhere, so I'm not going to dwell on those. Um, so what I'm going to um, focus more on is uh, controlling welding fume, and particularly uh, trying to control welding fume over an, a large organisation. Um, but the same approach would work elsewhere as well. So... <laughs> I think it's always useful to start with some sort of initial scoping of the challenge that's in front of you. So how many welders do you actually have that you need to think about? What type of welding is it that they're doing? And we've seen there's MMA, MIG, TIG, and uh, others as well, MAG. Uh, where are those welders? Are they all in one place? Are they perhaps spread across multiple countries? Um, are they in different parts of the business? Are there any urgent concerns? And urgent concerns might be that there's particular regulatory interest. I know the health and safety executive have been doing some, some visits to locations in the UK. Uh, and certainly that, I'm sure, has led to some urgent concerns in some places from the reports that HSE have put out. Um, but maybe you've also got, uh, or instead got results showing high exposures, or perhaps you've got no local exhaust ventilation in use on indoor welding. And with the uh, carcinogen categorization now, that becomes really problematic. Or maybe you've got employee or union concerns. So they might be reasons for an urgent concern. And in those cases, you'd want to put some interim controls in. They're probably going to be respiratory protective equipment, perhaps um, quick fix type LEV, at least initially, while you figure out what the better approach would be longer term. You also need to understand in your initial scoping what your current level of control is. Do you already have lots of extraction in place and it's working really well? That probably means you're trying to refine what you've got. Or have you got a situation where actually you know you've got very little control? What's the understanding in the organisation about the hazards of welding fume? Is it something you're going to have to work on or is it something that uh, is an open door waiting to be resolved? The same with hs &E commitment. And we heard earlier from Adrian about the high standard, and that's really uh, aligned with the management system uh, 45001, ISO 45001. So what sort of hs &E commitment have you got within your organisation? Is it going to be quite a fight or are you in a good place and you can uh, persuade the senior managers accordingly. And what routes do you have to your decision makers? Because at the end of the day, it's them that are going to have to uh, stump up the money and, and also the commitment to make the improvements that might be necessary. So once you've done some initial scoping, um, it's probably the next stage to go and start getting some commitment to making some improvements. So. Who are those decision makers that you're going to have to persuade? Um, of course, it'll depend on the scope of what you're trying to do. Is it whole company? Is it just one small location? Um, if it's a whole company, then you're almost certainly going to have to get the chief executive officer, the chief financial officer, chief operations officer. Uh, maybe it's a business MD uh, and the employees or union reps as well to get them on board. If it's a more local thing, then... Uh, local management might be sufficient. They may have the budgetary powers to make things happen. You obviously also need to make your case. So uh, based on your initial scoping, what is it that you're asking for? Uh, you need to give some sense of a timeline and the costs involved and the people that you might need. You know, this might, if it's small, it might be possible to resolve yourself. If it's bigger, you might need a, a team to help you to do it. And there may be significant costs involved. Don't forget to build into this, though, some other benefits. Certainly on previous occasions, we've tried to 
uh, or have been involved in improving welding uh, fume control. Um, there's been painting nearby, and actually, when we improved the welding fume control, we found that the paint quality went up. Not a surprise, perhaps, you'll say, but you're absolutely right. But from uh, the business point of view, that could be a real benefit that will help to um, justify a cost. Also found that there was a reduction in maintenance. There was uh, quite a lot of welding fume was getting into machinery and into um, some of the electrical panels that had to be cleaned out on a regular basis. And it was possible to reduce that too. You also need to set out what you're trying to achieve. You know, what's this, the vision, the, the intent behind what you're trying to achieve with your uh, improvement? So um, on a previous occasion, I used a, a very simple one, which was just to apply the control hierarchy and by doing so, reduce the welding fume exposures to as low as reasonably practical. It's actually the legal requirement in the UK, but it was a very clear statement of what we were trying to achieve. Um, when you are gaining that commitment, don't just ask for support to implement the controls. I think you'll also potentially at least need support for a team of key personnel to help you to move this forward. Um, when we're doing a global improvement project, I made sure we got a senior leader as a project sponsor. That particular business had separate managing directors for different businesses. And I drew one of those, one that was interested, thankfully, um, identified which one was interested and drew them into becoming a project sponsor. Gives you um, an opportunity to engage someone at a really senior level that can have conversations that are sometimes difficult to have either on your own or, in, or with certain people. Um, also, so want to back you up in, in governance meetings. Also engage with uh, the hs &E team, the maintenance team, manufacturing engineers, line managers, and welders themselves, really key people in what you're trying to do. Uh, you might, if it's a really big project, need some project management support, and possibly you'll need some specialist external help as well. I might come on to that a little while. Okay, we also need to think about how you're gonna project govern. You know, what, what sort of governance you're gonna put around this project? Um, you need to build on that basis a project scope and a plan. Um, I've been um, involved in one or two projects in the past and failure usually comes from uh, some scope creep or faltering commitment. So if you can really set out what your project scope is and what the plan is, and you can hold to that, then you're in a much better place. It doesn't mean it can't be changed. Obviously, if you suddenly find something really significant that needs to be dealt with, then it probably needs to be added in, but you don't want it to just creep without uh, definite decisions to do so. Um, you also need to agree the frequency of that communication. Um, again, it will depend on what your scope is, but you know, um, on the larger project, project updates through the hs &E board to the CEO, CFO and COO so that they can see that the money they're spending is actually achieving something. Uh, and also to ask for help if there's some real issues that are starting to appear. Uh, also to management and employee or union reps meetings so that they're engaged as well and involved in the process. At project team meetings to update, align and address issues. You've often got little working groups for specific topics and you need to bring all of that together. I think it's important to be open about the challenges. Um, usually if you open up about these things, people will help. Uh, and if they don't help, well, at least you know they're not going to help and you can get on with trying to find an alternate solution. Um, I found it um, useful to bring in some simplification. You know, can you group what it is you're trying to do? So some ideas here around practical simplification. A welding type, if you've got a variety of different welding types, then perhaps um, the welding type can be a determinant in what type of control you apply. Similarly with materials, you know, maybe you've got uh, fairly consistent components and consumables or a bit of a spread. Again, that might provide you with a means of separating out different challenges. Same with location, is it in the same building, is it the same city, country, is it indoors or outdoors? They might be important factors too. Same with organisation. Is there a line management Thing. Is it a business division? You know, is it across the whole company? Uh, the activity, um, is it continuous? Is it on a daily and pretty frequent basis or is it occasional? You know, if you've got someone who's doing production 
welding, that's a completely different situation to someone who is occasionally going in and doing a little bit of um, maintenance welding. And different controls are likely to be appropriate. Size of components is important, and um, Adrian showed that when he went through the welding control selector tool, in that uh, smaller uh, components, you can generally fit them into some sort of a, a booth or perhaps a downdraft table, whereas large components, much harder to do that, uh, often not practicable to do that, and you need to look for alternative solutions. Also, where the position is, is it in a fixed place? Is it a mobile activity? Is it perhaps in a confined space? Again, makes a big difference. And finally, um, the standards. You know, are you applying these within one jurisdiction, one uh, national legal framework, or is it a global thing? And if it is a global thing, do you apply the same standards as you would in the highest uh, place of standards within the organisation? And certainly, as far as I'm concerned, and I suspect as far as all of you are concerned, if you've got high standards in one part of your organization, you should be applying those same standards everywhere. The value of a life is the same in any part of the world. And through this characterization of the challenges that's in front of you, you can probably group your challenges into different groups that you can apply very similar approaches to. And although these are a number of factors, in reality, from your particular situation, that will tend to define the groups that make sense for you. There are some other benefits of grouping as well as making a definition of the uh, solutions uh, simpler. It helps you to deliver consistency. You can define it once and then you can copy and paste it across the rest of the organization. Of course, you may need to tweak it locally and you should do that if that's necessary. But effectively, if you've got one solution that works, then you can apply that broadly. It's also an opportunity to trial or pilot the solution before you commit it more widely. Uh, clearly, there can be some really significant costs associated with this. And, and if that's the case, piloting it and trying to get it right in one place before spreading it is an excellent way of going forward. Uh, you could also imagine that there's some significant buying power potential. Uh, if your supplier knows that this is a trial, then they're really gonna try and make it work with you. They want to get the rest of your business. So you've got an opportunity there to, to leverage that desire for more uh, orders from yourself. And of course, the bigger the potential order, the harder they're gonna work with you to make it a success. And you can imagine on the um, business where we had uh, 2000 welders, the people we were working with on those particular projects were really quite keen to get their solution into place and to make it work perfectly or as well as they could so that we'd be happy to proceed with their particular uh, solution. Um, it's also a useful thing to play well to your senior leadership. You're effectively saying to them, we're not just rushing at this, we're, we're testing it, we're proving it, and then we're going to move forward with the spend. Uh, so I think that's a, a positive way forward as well. You're giving confidence that you're trying to do the right thing. So once you've done that, what's next? Well, do you need or want uh, exposure measurement? Um, in the UK, there's a clear duty to reduce exposures as low as reasonably practicable. In that case, what benefit would taking measurements deliver? Well, at the outset, it might not have that many benefits at all. It might be more appropriate to assess your exposures after you've made the improvements, because in that way, you can prove the effectiveness of the controls that you put in place. And you also assess the residual risk, which might require additional measures to ensure that as low as reasonably practical, which may include uh, respiratory protective equipment. Um, another question you might want to ask is, is Breathe Freely and other control information clear enough, or do you need some specialist help? Well, certainly Breathe Freely tries to provide uh, a thorough um, set of information, but there are going to be some circumstances where you might think, I need to just make sure. Those situations might be where you've got high toxicity, maybe you've got complex situations with no clear solution, maybe you want to put a, a, a little additional resource in to help the process move quickly, so you're just trying to uh, help the businesses and the sites understand what's going on, or you might want an external perspective to persuade. We all 
I think when we've worked inside a company, recognize that you can bring a, a consultant in and what you've been saying three, four, five times uh, suddenly becomes relevant as soon as a consultant says it. It's very frustrating, but uh, um, you know certainly that can sometimes help. Or perhaps you're going to be spending a, a significant amount of money and you want to bring a specialist in just to uh, provide confidence that what you're intending to do is well direct. So there's a number of reasons why you might want to bring some specialist help in. We've seen this before. This is the hierarchy of control, and certainly this is what determines the direction we need to go. So can we eliminate? Can we modify? Do we need local extraction, working practices, and RPA? So let's think about elimination of welding in a practical sense. So um, we worked with design engineers, and we looked at what our options were. Well, maybe we could make it in one piece through machining, forging, or even 3D printing. Um, Providing you can set, meet the same technical specifications, then you can use whatever uh, method of manufacture you wish, I presume. Um, you can construct from composites in one piece or using adhesives. Again, that's a possibility. It's lighter weight, can be a strong, but clearly it does have different properties that might not meet your requirements. We actually were seriously tracking down two particular approaches. One was um, considering using metal adhesives instead and for certain um, situations we found that they were stronger although we'd not got them through to testing them in practice and the other alternative was to redesign the project the product sorry to avoid as many joints as possible so you weren't quite making it in one piece but you were certainly making it in um, fewer pieces which needed less um, welding to connect them there may well be other alternatives that you can apply to your particular situation. You can also look at process modification. So robot welding, uh, again, with the manufacturing engineering team, um, we found that we got some really clear quality, cost, and productivity benefits in many cases. It didn't work for everything, but it certainly worked for those repetitive tasks that were uh, long runs on welding. Um, in those situations, we actually found that the payback, even though the robots and the booths and the extraction that went around them was significant, the payback was actually in less than two years. It really did pay for itself. And to make sure that we weren't introducing uh, an issue with welding fume, we ensured that all of our new robots were to be fully enclosed and extracted so that we got no uh, deterioration in the uh, working atmosphere. By doing this, you're effectively removing the weld of the operative from the welding fume, and it also eliminates exposure for not only the welder, but the uh, secondary exposures to team leaders and other people that are working in that area. So um, some significant improvements that could be achieved by robot welding. Doesn't work in all situations, but certainly can do. Uh, there are other process modifications, and Tobias uh, spoke earlier about some of these. So. Um, reducing the manganese in the wire, we looked at doing that because we were concerned about the manganese concentrations, but we were doing MIG on mild steel. Again, this was with the manufacturing engineering team. We did get some reduction in man manganese from that. Um, it wasn't a one-to-one -one relationship, but unfortunately, the quality and the strength of the welding was affected, uh, particularly if it wasn't a skilled welder that was doing the work. So. Um, we felt that it wasn't a way that we could move forward. So we rejected that particular approach. Uh, but it did, in doing the work, did deliver some unintended benefits. Um, it turned out that the welders had altered the settings. Um, so the wire feed speeds, the gases, uh, flow rates, and the, the power settings on the system. Um, the welder's aim was to try and speed up the welding. Um, what it actually led to was a significant increase in the fume emission rates and poor quality of welding. Um, so we reverted to the standard requirements and these are often set by international standards and that resulted in some improvement of the welding fume, as well as actually saving significantly in cost consumables and reduced rework. Um, it wasn't enough of a reduction in the welding fume um, to avoid needing other controls, but it certainly made uh, a difference. 
And again, to buy us talked about these, so I'm not going to dwell on them, but there are other things you can change within the processes. Um, again, they're not enough to prevent welding fume, but they can make some improvements. So the voltage of current, the gases in the mix, the consumables, the feeds and speeds, uh, and the competence, um, uh, as well as uh, um, Tobias's organisation, there's, a, I suspect, an affiliate, the TWI, in the UK as well. Um, so having looked at uh, elimination, having looked at process modification, we then moved on to local extraction, local exhaust ventilation, LEV. So we needed to determine the appropriate LEV. And to do that, you might use the welding control selector tool or bring in those specialist resources to help you to do that. We've already seen it provides advice in the control selector tool on the optimum type, the design parameters, the pitfalls to avoid and some alternative approaches. There are many suppliers out there that can deliver those different types of LEV. What you need to do is really look to one uh, with the required competence to develop the solution with you. And that'll depend on the situation you're faced with. If you've got a simple situation, there's probably an off-the-shelf uh, product that you can use for a standard welding activity. If you've got something that's more complex, you might need a bespoke design. And if you do need a bespoke design, you might want to think about bringing in a competent LEV engineer as well as a supplier to make sure that what you get is good. What I'm going to do now is illustrate the, um, the approach through an on-torch extraction selection. I know there's a question on on-torch extraction earlier, and you're absolutely right. It isn't perfect. Uh, sometimes it is the only practicable approach to LEV because of the size of the components, but it is certainly not as effective as a booth or a downdraft table. But it's, it's better than, uh, than nothing. Maybe the only practical approach. So an on-torch system. We had uh, extended runs of welding, so um, a fixed system wasn't going to work. And they're also large and complex components. So we couldn't um, design and, and put in place a booth that would achieve the, the control for the welder because they were moving around the component um, on a regular basis and all sorts of directions are having to weld in. So we recognize that on torch system was the best way forward, the most practicable for us. We pulled together a working group, which was led by our manufacturing engineers. And that working group included welders, purchasing, line managers, and health, safety, and environment as needed. We got some external support from occupational hygienists to move things along. Um, although uh, that's what I am, and same with Adrian, I felt that I needed some additional support because of the, uh, the extent of what we were trying to achieve. And our spend was going to be in the region of two million pounds. So we wanted to make sure we were doing the right thing. I also needed someone who could go around all of the sites and persuade the managing directors that there really was uh, an issue of their particular systems. And, and to do that, I asked the hygienist to do a survey. Not measurements, just a, a walkthrough to say what type of systems they got. So they effectively did the, the grouping that we were looking to do. And we, on the on-torch systems, we did a market review. Uh, we engaged with the current welding torch supplier and also other occasional suppliers. We looked out to the wider market of what was out there, and we selected five companies and asked them to provide on-torch systems for us to try. They were also asked to provide their recommended LEV system matched to their on-torch system, and we gave each of them a half-day slot to come and demonstrate what they could achieve. They had to attend and they had to set it up. So they couldn't claim that we'd made a mistake in the setup. We didn't want any arguments along those lines. And effectively, we ran exactly the same uh, test, exactly the same welding with each and every one of the LEV and on-torch systems. We also, before we set out on this, defined some selection criteria. And for us, those selection criteria were the weight of the torch, including with the LEV attached, the grip shape, the ergonomics effectively, the ease of use and the maintenance, the heat within the torch, the cost, both initial and the consumables, 
um, user feedback, which was really critical to us. We needed to get them on board if we were going to change over. And the global capability, could the supplier actually deliver globally? We then also included the monitoring results and we got from between about a 35 and a 70% reduction in the uh, welding fume at the exposure to the operator. This was outside the visor because they're all wearing the visors with the air fed system. So 35 to 70%, they're not perfect, but they're definitely uh, if achieving some reduction, certainly effective in that sense. And when you haven't got the ability to put a, a booth or a downdraft table in place, they were the most practical solution that we had available to us. Having selected the preferred one, we then worked with the supplier to refine it further. Um, of course, we tried to sharpen their price up a little bit. And as I say, with the 2000 welding sets being needed, that was um, easier than it might have been with just five. Um, but more importantly, we were looking for usability improvements, maintainability, and interface with the LEV system. And in requesting those things, uh, they uh, offered us up a Wi-Fi connected system for the LEV so they could see when it was operating, when it was starting to show a problem. And on the torch, they'd got a, a consumable on the end, which was the end of the gun. And it was actually quite a large component. And we, we asked them to change it to two components that could be separated because we knew that the end of it was likely to get damaged, but the other part of it wasn't. So we wanted to only have to change out the small bit and they were happy to do that. And that saved about £10 on consumables each time it needed to be uh, swapped. After the initial trial, we phased it in across one business with about 100 welding sets in place over three months. And from that, we found some other minor issues, uh, a few teething problems with the way the systems were being set up by themselves and, to be honest, with us as well. And we resolved those by working together collaboratively. And it actually helped the manufacturer to improve their product further. And I believe they went on to be able to uh, improve what they're offering to market. We're ready to implement that in the UK at the point that uh, I seized my association with this organization. And we were in the process of uh, uh, rolling it out for a trial globally. And we'd agreed a location to do that. What we found, and this is the, the lessons learned, was that uh, the users are absolutely critical, and so are the supervisors. Most problems we had in the pilot were down to the welder, their non-acceptance of what we were trying to do. As usual, you got about a third of them that were happy to go along, a third of them that were pretty um, passive around it and just got on, kind of got on with it, but not in an enthusiastic way, and a third that were fairly resistant because of course they've been doing it for 30 years. It always used the same type of welding torch and so on and so on. So we found that it was really important to get people engaged. It was exacerbated by the supervisor's resistance or misunderstanding of what we were trying to achieve. Uh, so we made sure later on that we took them uh, into uh, a, more, a greater understanding of what we were trying to do. Uh, so one month in as well, we implemented a much more hands-on rollout. Previously, we just put the systems in place and just told them to get on with it with some briefing to the supervisors who were then expected to brief the welders. Realised that wasn't good enough. And instead, we started to uh, pilot a team briefing to the supervisors and to the welders before the switch. Now, why are we doing it? How does it work? What should they do? What can't they do? Um, it's not just about you, it's also about everyone because they were wearing RPE and continue to wear RPE. Um, it's about everyone, so you need to do the right thing. And what the consequences would be of not using the controls that were provided. We were quite gentle around that. We were just reminding them that there was a duty to, to use the controls, but really the primary uh, focus, uh, at least for the first few months, was going to be much more around persuasion, observation, and just reminding people to do the right thing. Um, we did have a residual risk, and it, what residual risk you've got left will depend on the LEV design and whether you can optimise it. But for on torch, there's likely to be residual exposure. It's not perfect, as we said before. Um, so we brought in, well, we continued to use the secondary controls that we got in place, the powered air purifying respirator. 
who have out mounted filters, they provided filtered air into the visor and the helmet system. And I think even if we'd not needed them from a, a welding fume point of view, the welders would have probably been quite upset with us if we'd taken it away because um, they usually like them because of the cooling effect that you get from the air passing across their face. Welding gets pretty warm. Uh, and in terms of residual risk, don't forget the supervisors. We, before we started doing this work, we looked at past um, exposure, uh, well, past monitoring results that we got from the general area, not from people, but just from in the general area. And we thought, well, they look a little bit uh, suspect. And then we, so we put some uh, exposure monitoring onto the team leaders and one and two other people, forklift truck drivers and the like. And we found that half of the team leaders were exceeding the manganese workplace exposure limit as a result of its significant reduction. So we implemented some RPE for them uh, as an interim ahead of the LEV improvements that we're putting in place. So don't just think about the welders. It is also about potentially the other people that are working in there as well. And around this, uh, the high standard, as Adrian alluded to as well, um, we've got some, you need to have some effective management. So apply the management system approach to include safe systems of work, plan preventive maintenance, inspections, supervision, you know, making sure that people are doing the right things. And of course, that the managers are keeping um, the supervisors on the toes a little bit as well. So as they're also doing the right thing. Uh, monitoring of usage. In our case, we were able to use a cloud-based approach with the Wi-Fi on the LEV to see what was going on. Um, welding settings to make sure they didn't move. Um, RPE use, checks and repairs. Uh, governance, uh, really in the local uh, health and safety meetings, but also more globally on how things were going and the effectiveness of controls. Learn from any incidents and, of course, provide continued information, instruction and training and do some audits. Okay, David, over to you. Are there any questions? Neil, many thanks. Uh, yeah, that was very insightful. There's a, there's a couple of questions. Uh, so the first one is, when carrying out welding of stainless steel outdoors, were other operational activities, where, sorry, other operational activities are taking place? What other types of controls should be considered aside from PPE? Well, I suppose it really does, and I can't be specific, but it really does depend on the situation that you've got and you need to assess that particular situation. If it's in a consistent location or it's uh, accessible to LEV, then it ought to be possible to do some LEV. Maybe it's on torch, not perfect yeah. as we said, but maybe that's a, a possibility. It really does depend on the situation, but um, LEV is certainly a possibility outside as well as inside. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then from Cathy, I would be interested to hear what method you use for monitoring the welding fume, fume as you mentioned outside the welding hood as PAPR was used. Yeah, well, we use the, um, the approach that you would normally use um, for fume, but we did it on the lapel to make sure we were getting a, an outside the um, RPE because we wanted to understand what the differences were, but we didn't want to expose the individual to um, welding fumes. So, and if we'd have put it inside the hood, it would have been virtually zero because we got the, the filter on there. So we just used a, um, the uh, IOM head, I believe it was, because effectively all welding fume is respirable. So we weren't too worried about yeah. doing it with a respirable head. Yeah. So uh, that answers your second question. Catty, whether it was respirable or inhalable. So uh, uh, very yeah, timely. We, we just assumed that it was all respirable because it's effectively welding fume, very fine. So we took that yep. to be the case. And then just one final question, I'm conscious of time. Are there any guides for auditing the welding process? Um, no, well, there's, um, there's nothing specific. I mean, you could apply the high standard. There's a guide in there for looking at uh, health uh, hazards within the workplace. Um, I think it's like any other uh, audit, isn't it? You look at the situation you've got and you start to ask questions around whether you've identified the hazard, whether you've um, got a residual risk, what controls you've got in place, are the controls working, do the people have the necessary training, are you doing the planned maintenance on it, all of the things you would normally do for 
any uh, situation from a health and safety point of view. Okay. Uh, there are no other questions uh, for, for Paul or Adrian or Tobias. There is just one final question from a, a collective, which is really great to see. Uh, they are they they put it anonymously, which doesn't matter. But uh, they they want to know: is there an email uh, where you can register your interest for volunteering for the Breathe Freely program? Which I personally think is is a fantastic thing. So, uh, Adrian Neil, is is there anywhere you can go to volunteer? Yes, uh, it is. Sorry, AD. Yeah, yes, yes, yes there is. Uh, there, there was a email address on the slides that will go out, I guess, will it be um, to be available? Yeah. So you'll be able to pick it up from there. So it's briefly at bohs.org. Brilliant. Yeah, if, that's fantastic. So, uh, and if anybody has any problems, just uh, email myself or the, or the European Section Secretary and we can put you in contact with the relevant uh, parties within the Breathe Freely campaign. So with that, uh, that draws us to a close today. I would just, uh, on behalf of the entire section, like to thank all of our speakers today. So from Tobias to Paul to Adrian to Neil, a uh, big thank you to both the European Welding Federation 3M and uh, BOHS for providing the speakers. Very, very much appreciated. Uh, I think that was a fantastic way to complete the 2022 programme for the section. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all again next year for next year's events. They will be posted out on the ISRP uh, website as and when they're available. But with that, I will just thank again our speakers for today and wish you all a pleasant evening. <laughs>